TGI Friday, everybody. Hi, Thomas Miller on the Fun Astrology Podcast. Oh, we made it through the week. (laughs) I got to say, you guys are so amazing. You are such cool people. You are so incredible. And I have had the best time of my life. I was going to say a blast, and it has been a blast talking to you on these readings this week. And oh my gosh, the synchronicities and the connections of like, oh, here's a message over here that needs to be over here, and I'm putting people together and feeling like a Libran all of a sudden. But the response that you've had to this has just been overwhelming, and I certainly appreciate it. Over the weekend, I'm going to be looking at the schedule and trying to open up some more slots, so we'll just try to keep all this moving. But readings are booking if you want one. I mean, they have been magical, truly. And that's because of the great stuff that you bring to the table. And because of that, I kind of hit a wall the other night, and I uh, had a little heart issue, and I've got to stop and pause and just kind of work through this. So here's the other thing that I'm doing that I'm just so excited about. Steve Forrest engaged me to do a book that I've wanted to do since we finished the Elements series, The Book of the Moon. I haven't gotten as much done on it as I would have liked this week, but the introduction is done, and if you don't mind, for this TGI Friday, I'd love to share the enthusiasm that I've had for this with you. In fact, just to show you the crazy kind of synchronicities that have been happening, one of the readings today, what Steve talks about here, is exactly what she wants to talk about in the reading, and that's been happening over and over. So I'm going to leave you now with Steve Forrest, the book that is in production, The Book of the Moon. So what's your moon phase? Go among astrologers and casually ask any of them, where's your moon? You will certainly hear a sign of the zodiac. Aquarius, says the fellow with bright eyes, madly gleaming. Taurus, says the woman in the moo-moo. And there's a good chance you'll hear a house position, too. Gemini in the 11th says the elfin-eyed girl, glancing curiously around the crowded room. Possibly you'll get more detail than you bargained for. Virgo, says the bookish-looking gent, in the sixth house by Placidus, but in the fifth house by Coke and Meridian, conjunct Venus, but square Uranus, and sesquiquadrate the midpoint of Mars and Mercury, and biquintile to Tezcatlipoca, and... (laughs) got that? But there is something you will almost never hear. My moon is in the waxing gibbous phase. And yet, what could be more obvious about the moon in the sky than its phase? A crescent moon and a full moon are entirely different beasts, visually. So why don't we hear about that? That obvious equals important seems to be a very reliable astrological principle. Why is the lunar phase astrology's lost dimension? Immediately, astrological scholars might object. They'll make reference to the well-known work on lunar phases done by the great Dane Rudyard in his epical 1967 book, The Lunation Cycle. There, he devotes about 40 pages to the topic. The scholars may also quote a volume that they may have never read, A Vision, by the splendid Irish poet William Butler Yeats, a profoundly dense work on lunar phase published in 1937. They may follow the reference to Yeats with a mention of another book, which explores the same terrain published in 1988, Moon Phases, a Symbolic Key, by one of my favorite astrologers, Martin Goldsmith. Some may remember the hard-to-find 1974 book, Phases of the Moon, A Guide to Evolving Human Nature, written by Marilyn Bustide, Richard Tiffany, and Dorothy Worgan, or the wonderful Finding Our Way Through the Dark by Demetra George. My point is not that lunar phase has never been discussed in the astrological literature. It has. My point is that lunar phase has not caught on as a significant element of practical astrology. A minority of the present-day astrologers could name one or two of the books I just mentioned, and only a few of them could describe in any detail the actual contents of these works. And almost no one includes the moon's phase in their interpretations. Why? Lunar phase is dramatic, it is beautiful, and it hits us over the head when we look up at the sky. So why is it regulated to a minor footnote in modern astrological practice? 
ch-ch-ch-changes. Let me seem to change the subject for a few lines. The 1890s society that my grandparents knew is almost as alien today as Shakespeare's England. The world my parents met when they were young feels nearly that exotic. No air conditioning, no television, much of Africa and Amazonia still unexplored, a world population under two billion. The changes witnessed by the past three or four generations are unprecedented in their scale and reach. It's easy to be awed by their technological dimension. But what about our collective attitude toward gender, race, gayness, church, the environment? What about our attitude, for one American example, toward Turkey or Indonesia? When I was growing up, these countries seemed like other planets. Now they are places I go, where I have friends who do not seem so radically different from me. I email them and they email me. Sometimes I even know what they had for breakfast. And the list goes on. What about marriage? What about the expectations we hold of fathers toward their children? What about healing and seeking spiritual or psychological counsel? Paradigm shift is one of those terms that has become odious through overuse. And yet, has there ever before in human history been such a profound shift in everything? Here, in a nutshell, is the case I want to make for this book, that the current paradigm shift has finally opened a window on the meaning of lunar phase. Up until now, I believe that astrologers have been in the position of 15th century astronomers who tried to reason about what they observed in the heavens while simultaneously maintaining the assumption that the Earth was the center of the universe. Like them, we have been blinded by what we thought we knew. But the old system of belief, with its blind spots, is giving way to something new. A fresh way of being human is emerging. As the old paradigm dies, for the first time we begin to see things that have always been there. As usual, with big mythic changes, this shift is not happening quickly. And of course, it is a scary ride as we watch the old certainties hit the wall. In Chapter 6, I will make my specific argument for the precise way the old, patriarchal, mechanistic belief system has blinded us to the lunation cycle. I think I will prove that we astrologers have been terribly limited in our understanding of lunar phase because of cultural assumptions and prejudices. I will do my best to ferret out the new assumptions and show how they reveal insights into the lunar cycle that we have simply not been ready to see very clearly until now. Insights that, at least for me, triggered a compelling fall of the intellectual dominoes. I think that you'll find the same thing that I found, which is that as I shed some epistemological baggage that I had carried since I was a child, lunar phase clicked into place. I believe that I will also make a good case that the roots of this quote-unquote new understanding are actually quite ancient and still detectable in the cultural traces left by the so-called pagan people of pre-Christian, pre-Aristotelian Europe. Before exploring all that, I want to lay a foundation of basic lunar theory in the context of evolutionary astrology. This I will do in the next chapter. There, we will learn some counseling room perspectives on the moon in general, which will later be relevant to lunar phase. We will first investigate them in the more familiar terrain of the lunar sign and house. In Chapter 3, I want to introduce some details about the mechanics of lunar phase and also pay homage to the pioneers in this branch of astrology whom I mentioned earlier, Yeats, Rudyard, and the rest. They have much to teach us, despite their frequent immersion in the cultural blind spots to which I have been referencing. Finally, I understand that there is a certain audacity in what I claim to be doing in this book. I believe in what I am about to write, otherwise I would not write it. But I am also acutely aware of making bold claims, dismissing some existing work, 
and then stepping into territory that is significantly uncharted. That's an age-old formula for spectacular pratfalls, and I will surely make some, and I'll probably make some enemies. But I pray I make some friends, too, friends who will stand on my shoulders and see further than I have. Thank you, readers and listeners, for coming on this journey with me. Thank you to my clients and students for letting the realities of your lives correct my mistakes. And thank you once again, Integrative Medicine Foundation, for making it possible for me to write this book. Now, let's go to the moon. Well, you see why this is such a thrill to be working on, and when it's released, I'll be letting you know. Have a great weekend, everybody. I am planning to be back tomorrow with Merriman, but it probably will be a little later in the morning. Level up on Sunday night on Facebook and YouTube and back here again on Monday. Sending you all kinds of love for the next several days. 